everybody hear me? Um, when Bill called me back in November or December and asked me if I would uh, consider doing a clinic for the USARD convention, I was floored. I was, uh, I, I, it, to me, it was, uh, it was an extreme honor to be asked to come and do a clinic. Um, now, for those of you that don't know, I predominantly play match grip. <laughs> don't throw, don't throw your sticks yet. It's okay. Um, I did learn how to play traditional grip when I had, when I marched in the cadets and the and, the, and college the college drum line that I played at. A few months ago. But uh, I do predominantly play match grip. Um, my clinic today. You want? I can put it in. Yeah. Everybody got one? A couple more left. Testing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I'll buy Verizon if you do that. <laughs> so, my. My topic for my clinic is what is rudimental drumming? Uh, that may seem kind of uh, interesting given that this is a convention of rudimental drummers. If anybody should know what rudimental drumming is, it should be us, right? Um, unfortunately, over the years, I think uh, you know everyone has a different conception of what rudimental drumming is. Uh, for instance, is it just the simple act of playing rudiments? Well, if that's the case, then all drummers are rudimental drummers because even the simplest form of drumming involves rudiments of some some form. So, where do we where do we draw the line and say what is it, what exactly is rudimental drumming? Is it playing on a marching drum? Is it playing traditional grip, match grip? You know, match grip came along years later, uh, and it was. Uh, introduced into the marching field when the technology for the marching drums got to the point where you could play a uh, match grip on a field drum while you're walking. <coughs> so, what what exactly is rudimental drumming? Uh, I'll tell you what I think it is. I think it's the study of coordination. It's the study of learning how to coordinate one hand from the other. Um, when you first learn how to, when you when you were a beginner drummer, the first thing you had to learn how to do was single strokes. You had to learn how to coordinate the hands, and then as you got faster, you had to learn how to keep the volume level. You had to learn how to coordinate, to make sure that, that uh, your sticks didn't fly off and uh, make all kind of execution errors. And then along came the paradiddle, and then it's like, whoa, what's this paradiddle? You had to learn how to. To, uh, in order to properly execute the paradigm. So, coordination with respect to physiology, coordination is um, it's the harmonious functioning of muscles or groups of muscles in the execution of movement. And the more rudiments we learn, the more coordinated we become. So, I think uh, rudimental drumming is the study of coordination. And you could even extend it to all four limbs. If you were playing a drum set, you have to learn how to be coordinated on a drum set with your feet as well as your hands. So rudimental drumming then becomes uh, learning the coordination of all four limbs. So to me, what this means is, and I think we've always known this as, as rudimental drummers, it means that rudimental drumming is not a fringe idiom out here. Rudimental drumming is actually the basis of all drumming. It is what all drumming stems from. You learn drumming, once you learn your rudiments and you learn how to coordinate your movements, and you learn how to coordinate the muscles, then uh, you can apply that to anything. Um, what got me started down this road thinking of this, uh, of what exactly is rudimental drumming, we all know that uh, 
through the years, uh, we have the ancient, the ancient uh, revolutionary style of drumming. We have the uh, modern style of fife drumming. There's Swiss drumming. There's uh, pipe band drumming. There's so many different styles of drumming in the rudimental field that all of them claim to be rudimental drumming. But what ties them all together? It's, it's learning how to be coordinated. Um, and again, what got me started thinking about this was uh, I went to PAS, the PAS convention, back in like 2003 or 2004. And uh, they have an individual's competition on snare drum. They have a high school division and a college division. And um, uh, I was in the restroom and washing my hands and, and a little kid come in, high school kid, and he had a pair of uh, marching sticks. And I could tell that he was, he was there for the high school division snare drum competition. And I looked up and I saw him and I said, uh, so are you, are you in the rudimental contest? And he looked at me and he said, no, I'm playing on a snare drum. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I, I know that nine times out of 10, probably 10 times out of 10, he was probably, he was playing with marching sticks. I saw that. He was probably playing on a marching snare drum. He was probably playing rudiments in his solo. But to him, rudimental drumming, the concept of rudimental drumming was the ancient, you know, that's what he thought was rudimental drumming. And frankly, I was kind of stunned that uh, the younger crowd considered rudimental drumming to be a fringe idiom in the percussion world not the root. To me, it's the root of all percussion. So I'm going to play a couple of things. Um, once again, some of it will be match script, so don't throw any sticks. And uh, hope you enjoy it. And, uh, and then I want to go over some things that I thought helped me push my coordination up to a higher level, some different sticking patterns. Some of the things that helped me develop coordination to a higher level, I'll go over some of those. Uh, one of the first things I learned early on, and I'll tell the story about that, was uh, if you take a roll, you know, if you've looked at the uh, NARD chart of rudiments, the roll as it's notated has an accent on the And when I was a kid learning looking at the chart and trying to learn the rudiments and I saw that accent, I took it literally and I, I, that's how I practiced the role. And uh, my, uh, my drum instructor, he told me an interesting story about the accent on the role. He said back in the old days when the uh, drummers were playing their role and they started up like this, that first stroke was always very loud then the second stroke was always a little bit softer. So they put an accent on the second stroke to remind them to play that second stroke just as powerful as the first stroke. So 
So, but that wasn't how I was practicing it. I was actually practicing it like. same thing with triplets. You can take a triplet and to help increase your, your coordination. Same way with quads or fours. <clears throat> now one interesting uh, sticking combination that I realized really helped me was when you put it when you uh, put a flam after the accent say on the flam accent normally a flam accent is played with like that if you put the flam after the accent it takes a little bit more coordination to play it and it really helps you build up your coordination to a higher degree and it also helps you develop uh, what some of the some of the guys in the uh, that are playing now in the, the younger crowd is what they call mouths or backwards lambs. When you play the grace note after the main note, so when you play the root of the flam accent with the flam after the accent, that really helps you develop the. The, uh, backwards lambs. So you might ask, why would you even play backwards lambs? Well, they really don't serve much of a, of a use, in my opinion. You can't put them in a solo because most people are not going to know what they are. But the uh, to me, the important thing of a play in a backwards lamb is it does help you develop your coordination. You can take your coordination to a little bit higher de degree. You could also take a, a flam drag. You could put the uh, you could put the uh, flam on the drag itself. Like that. And once again, that helps you develop your coordination. Uh, I've talked about uh, putting buzzes on triplets. Hybrids, rudimental hybrids. Hybrids, uh, it's, 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 it, it sounds like a great name and it sounds like something new and new in, in the world of rudimental drumming. But actually, hybrids have been around for a long time. Drummers have been experimenting with different stickings and different, uh, taking the rudiments and mixing them up and playing them in different combinations and different ways. Uh, so, drummers have, rudimental drummers have always been playing hybrids. I mean, if you look at the list of rudiments, on the original NARD list, 
most of them are hybrids anyway. You've got some of your basic rudiments like the roll and the same stroke roll, but then every other rudiment probably after that is a hybrid rudiment, like a, like a triple rabbit cube. So uh, it's important to learn these different sticking combinations because they do help you develop your coordination to a higher degree. Um, but hybrids have been around, drummers have been experimenting with different sticking combinations. And another little story I can tell you is that uh, I think it was in 2006, I went to DCA and uh, one night we were, it was raining outside, but they had, the hotel had an awning outside and a bunch of drummers had gathered and we had drones and we were out there playing. And this uh, older gentleman walked up and he told us that he had played in the 1962 Boston Crusaders. And I was thinking, wow, that's some history there. And um, he said, uh, you know, we're all, it was me and there was a couple of other young whippersnappers that was playing some, some hybrids and they were whipping them out on the snare drum. And this, this, uh, this gentleman walked up and he said, can you play some, and he, he, he gave some name. And we were like, we don't know what you're talking about. What is it? What is it? What exactly is it? And he played something on the snare drum, and none of us could play it. We were sitting there like, we were just dazzled. Like, here's this guy from the 1962 Boston Crusaders that are schooling us. And um, <clears throat> I went home, and I, I really started thinking about, okay, what exactly was he was he playing? And it, I, it, I finally figured it out. Um, he was taking a. Um, a drag paradiddle, which is everybody knows, like that. He was shifting the accent to the paradiddle, not the tap, like that. And then he was slamming the rough, like this. I was thinking, wow, now that I was able to connect it to one of the original rudiments and figure out what he was actually doing, it made a lot more sense. But it also told me that drummers, even as far back as 1962 and even further back, were experimenting with hybrids and playing different sticking patterns. And so it was really nothing new. It was just drummers are drummers, and we're going to experiment, and there's nothing nobody can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's great because it means that we're we're always trying to achieve new things. We're always trying to hear, uh, to play new sounds, to come up with different sticking patterns. We're trying to take it to the next level. We're always trying to uh, see what we can do that somebody else hasn't thought of yet. Um, and that goes for like uh, the back sticking that was done by the, the great job done by the uh, Air Force uh, Quartet. Um, the, the back sticking came into the picture in the late 50s. We have different stick tricks now. Um, I think stick tricks as well can be considered rudimental drumming because rudimental drummers were some of the first ones to start using flash. Um, we were some of the first ones to, to go out and say, watch this. Even the fact of having a snare line come out and with the exact same sticking heights and they're playing together, that is flash. If you get down to it, that is flash. Uh, the first time you ever saw a line playing together in unison, I mean, didn't you stand back and say, wow, that looks impressive. Because everybody's synced up together. Um, so rudimental drumming, to me, all the other drumming um, stems from rudimental drumming. You learn your rudiments and then you go learn the drum set. Or you take a rudiment to the drum set and you figure out how to put it on the drum set. Um, so what I'm going to do now is, is I'm going to play a uh, double flam, a double grid parody. A double a grid is when you take a rudiment and you move the accent. Uh, for instance, if you were playing a flam accent and you decided to grid it, it would be like this. and the flam, you would have an inner grid and an outer grid. The, um, 
the way I chose to do it was to move the flam first and then move the accent. So your accent's gonna stay uh, constant for four measures while your flam moves, and then your accent's gonna move, and then your flam is gonna stay, um, your, then your flam is gonna move again for four measures. So let me go through that. It's on the handout. All-American Drummer. Uh, that book was one of the books that really helped me develop to a higher level. And I really liked Wilcoxon's approach of having short etudes and exploring different rudiments in each etude. <laughs> so I took that concept and I decided to apply some of the newer, uh, the newer hybrids and, and sticking combinations and stuff like that. And uh, so I'm going to play, first I'm going to play rudimental etude number 42 from my book, Rudimental Drummer. This etude has uh, some traditional rudiments in it, but it also has some other sticking patterns in it that uh, are not so traditional. So here we go. sticking. It has some uh, disjointed uh, five-stroke rolls and uh, paradiddles. It has a, a bunch of different combinations of uh, uh, different sticking patterns in it and some parts of it does sound disjointed but uh, the reason for that is, is to help you develop your control and try to control the stick. So I'll give it a shot. Uh, concludes my clinic on what is rudimental drumming. Um, I did have a section here where if there was any questions, if anyone had any uh, questions, give us that. <laughs> okay, I'll ask a question. All right. How much of the things you're playing in these last attitudes could you do as an ensemble? I mean, if you had four snares or six snares, could, could you get a group to do that? Or is this solo kind of? 
I think it could be worked on as an ensemble. It would take a lot more practice. <laughs> but I, I certainly think if one person can achieve it, I think many people can achieve it. Um, it would be interesting to see. Yeah. Are you going to bring? You can find somebody else who could achieve with. <laughs> you guys going to bring it next year? No, we're staying home. Yes. We can have it by quarter after. When I first got online around '98, I tried to communicate with somebody out there that, was, that had a rudiment book. Out. It may have been you. I may be apologizing to you. There was a miscommunication the way the emails went. It was a it was a miscommunication. But the question was originally: Is anybody looking at trying to incorporate formally some of the Scottish stuff into the list throughout? You know, either the, the 40 or the 20. Just adding to it. I know that hybrids take it up to the hundreds now, and maybe it's just too much information. But there's a couple few legit Scottish things that, that you're 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 playing around with a little bit. Uh, as far as uh, if anyone is actively uh, taking that and incorporating it into some kind of formal list, uh, the PAS committee tried to do that a couple of years ago. Um, they tried to upgrade the PAS 40, list of 40 movements into a bigger number of 80 or 100 or something. And they went off and they, they studied it for a couple of years. And uh, they came back and they, they, they kind of concluded you know, we can always put together a book this thick of different hybrids, uh, but maybe we should just concentrate on the important ones. Because really when it comes down to it, that's what we're trying to teach our, uh, our beginners, trying to get them incorporated to it. And if you throw a beginner a book this thick of hybrids, they might just say, whoa. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if it was mentioned or not, but I am the owner and operator of rudimentaldrumming.com. Um, I started it. It's the oldest logging website devoted to rudimental drumming. Uh, I love rudimental drumming in all forms, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, from the you know 1920s or whether it's uh, I, I, I like you. I think rudimental drumming is just great. It's something that uh, we all love, we all uh, cherish, and. Uh, when I started with mentaldrumming.com, uh, I did get a lot of emails from a lot of people. Uh, I was actually uh, taken aback by the number of emails that I got from various people. I got emails from people that said that uh, they were NARD member number 72, and <laughs> they, they were taught by, uh, they, they got their certificate from uh, Burns Moore, and uh, they wanted to know if, if NARD was still around or if their membership was still good. And I got all kind of questions. I mean, I got questions. I, I really didn't even know how to answer some of them. Um, uh, I referred, I tried to answer as many as I could. I referred people to uh, other experts. I sent some to, uh, to uh, uh, Mr., uh, let's see, what's his name? Uh, Beecher, is it Mark Beecher? Who, who restarted NARD. Um, I sent some to him, um, but I got all kinds of questions. I got, then I started getting emails from people overseas. I got emails from people from Thailand, from Japan, from Russia. I, uh, I still get emails. I think real mental drumming is drawing a bigger interest now outside of the United States than probably in the United States. Um, people are curious. The internet has, has, is responsible for this because people in other countries are now seeing YouTube videos of rudimental drummers and they're impressed and they want to learn how to do it. And I think rudimental drumming has a big, uh, it, you know, it's not over by a long shot. I think, I think it could explode into a worldwide phenomenon and we could see rudimental drummers competitions and, and quartets and stuff in other countries where they're taking rudimental drumming and they're applying it and they're learning how to do it. Any more questions? Yeah, I had one. How did the concept of hybrid rudiment, or hybrid come along? Because it's just like 
traditionally they had a name why they were the five stroke roll, the flam, and you can see it as they're explaining. But when they say hybrid, it's sort of a general thing. I heard it a couple of years ago. Like, oh, hybrid? How <laughs> I used to play those things, so I don't know how they how they came up with it. Why they did? I I think it's just an uh, it's just a good way. It's probably a way for people to when they say hybrids. It's a way for them to convey the idea that <clears throat> we're talking about non-traditional rudiments. So if someone says hybrid, then they're <clears throat> talking about something other than five stroke or seven stroke. They're talking about a book report or a Charlie Murphy. So they're going into rudiments. And and by the way, Shirley Murphy is is nothing new because Shirley Murphys have been played as, as long as I can remember. I know, I know drummers that that were playing before I was born that were playing Shirley Murphy's. So they just didn't call it Shirley Murphy, they just called it uh, a sloppy rhythm cue. Play one. <laughs> Play it for us. Shirley Murphy. Yeah. It's really uh, a single tap followed by two, a double, and then followed by a triple. or 58, I wrote that figure for the Air Force, but I only wrote it as eighth notes. Da, 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 Never occurred to me what you could do with it. You yeah. know, it was hard enough to do it one and a two and a one and a two and a. So yeah, everything, you know, you're talking about what you call hybrids, we call permutations. Permutations, and, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's what they are. Yeah, and, and right. you know, we were doing that in the 50s and the 60s in the Air Force, and you know, the, the quartet was in there, and, and, and these guys played in, we're doing lots of crazy things. So maybe you invented the Shirley Murphy. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> no, I dated her once, though. <laughs> Cute little thing. Well, that's why you invented it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every, and the other thing is, the other thing is, every time you come up with something that you think is new, I mean, it's been around for like 20, 30 years. Or exactly, more. exactly, exactly. Except for this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I was teaching a clinic in New Jersey about seven years ago, and a guy at the clinic had marched with uh, Garfield, or whatever they call that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, he said a guy on the bus came up with it. And said, "I'm gonna." He named it for his sister. Mm -hmm. So that was his story. It was, it was came from one of their guys in the '90s, and he named it for his sister. Well, refer him back to this gentleman here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we were, if this was a session and not a formal conference, the, the question would be: Could you play number two again? <laughs> number two, or rather, the one o two. One o two. One of two. Yeah, we don't believe you did it. This real <laughs> I think it was taped. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be on the yeah, internet now. So what you're saying is you really can't play it twice in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Can I see that? Well, what's my time on it here? You got plenty of time. <laughs> well, unfortunately for you, Until nice try. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Yeah, you got ten minutes. Somebody over here. I, I have to say that that one does require a lot of, uh, not just endurance, but it's, it's very taxing. Yeah. So, yeah, play it twice in a row. You got it. How do you read it? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, here goes. You going to follow along this time? <laughs> uh, if we can. All right. Do I need to turn this off while I'm playing? No, go ahead. Okay.
Nice job. You are my witness. Got another question. Okay. It seems to me that uh, through the years I've noticed that certain rhythmical combinations just seem to have a natural swing that it makes you want to tap your foot. And uh, I was wondering what your take would be on are, are there certain concepts or things that one can keep in mind toward that kind of creativity? Yeah, um, you've heard, you, we've probably all heard lines before in the past that came out and they, they had a swing feel to them. And it was probably more their interpretation of the rhythms. Or really any good rhythm that just makes you want to tap your foot. Right. It's good music. Mm -hmm. and it just, the groove. Not only swing, yeah. The groove, getting in the groove, like the bridge. The Bridgman drum corps was a very popular drum corps for being in the groove, being in the pocket. Uh, when they played their Dennis Delucia written uh, pieces, I mean, it, it it sounded like it went it fit that music. Just, that was Bridgman. Uh, Bridgman. Bridgman. Bridgman Drum and Bugle Corps back in the seventies uh, and eighties. Uh, Dennis Delucia wrote some excellent arrangements. Uh, his parts grooved like like. No other. Uh, and then we've heard uh, a lot of jazz interpretation uh, groups that came out, and they had some really nice sounding jazz drum parts. Uh, I think it's great that drum corps have uh, experimented with different styles of music instead of just the military marches, because it allowed them to expand into, into different areas, uh, coming up with different creativity, uh, trying to match uh, match the groove, so to speak, rather than just sounding like a mechanical, you know, just mechanical rudiments played on the drum. Uh, there definitely are some groups out there that come out and they swing, and I think it's great. Is that because of the uh, rhythmic figure com combinations? Pretty, pretty much. It was pretty much the interpretation of the rudiments themselves could, uh, could very well play into that. Um, the Bridgman, uh, there, there were some, there's been some recent discussions on this uh, on Facebook about uh, the, the Blue Devils interpretation of six stroke rolls versus the Bridgman's interpretation of six stroke rolls. The Bridgman, uh, I'm sorry, the Blue Devils are playing very tight. Type of music that the Bridgman was playing, that that sounded great. Mm -hmm. um, but now, if you played something really tight, like <laughs> on top of a jazz piece, it may not fit. It may not fit very well at all. So sometimes your interpretation of the rhythms will definitely decide if if your beat is grooving with the music. You have the best pocket. Yes. For that tempo. Exactly. And sometimes you have to listen to what the horns are doing or, or the other instruments, what they're doing, how they're interpreting the rhythms. This is the bass. Thank you. Uh, you were demonstrating the flam accent before. Do you use alternate sticking or were you doing like right, 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 left, left, left when you did the flam accents? Flam accents? Yeah. It was just a regular flam accent. <laughs> Oh, rope. They write all the stick. 
Right. When I first went into drum corps, a lot of these guys had rope, and I looked at it and said, plural or other. So I came back and ordered a notation, and they said I was writing in hieroglyphics. <laughs> so where did that start from? Was it, was it easier for drummers to learn that way, using the sticking, and then five for a five-stroke roll, seven for a seven, so on and so forth? Well, it, it's interesting you should ask about rope because I grew up in the public education system. I learned that's where I learned drumming. My band director was a he he want, he he played in various marching groups and he taught me how to play. Um, he he played traditional grip, but he chose to teach us match grip. Uh, he thought that that would be a faster way to learn, and and I think he was correct in that. Um, <clears throat> It wasn't until I went to drum corps when I even saw or heard what rote learning was. And I was actually amazed that there was, uh, the kids in the drum and bugle corps were learning their songs just from one, the, one guy would play, play a rhythm and the other guys would hear it and then they, it would stick in their brain and then they would all play it. And it's like, whoa. So it was a new learning experience for me to learn how to play music by memorizing it just by hearing somebody else play it. And probably how that started, my guess would be in, drum, in the drum and bugle corps world, they probably, they took a lot of kids in from the streets, kids that didn't uh, take music in public education, and uh, it was probably faster to teach them by rote. Uh, certainly, if they would have had to take time out to teach them how to read the notes, that would have uh, been a big, big time drain on uh, teaching the kids first how to read and then, okay, now here's your chart and learn, learn your chart now. So I think it would probably, it, it worked, I think it worked out pretty well for the kids just to, just to learn it by, uh, okay, I'm playing this and now you play it. I think there's trade-offs because my dad, uh, he plays what, what you call fiddle. He used to go and enter fiddle contests, and he, he taught himself how to play a fiddle. He could not read music, he, but his ear was fantastic. Uh, he could listen to any song and tell you what key it was in. He, he, uh, I think there's definite benefits to rope because it, it requires you to listen more. Um, I do think that uh, a person that learns how to read st just playing strictly from reading, they can get stuck into not really listening. Uh, they, they can become mechanical, trying to read the part versus trying to play with the other musicians. I think there's trade-offs. I think there's good and both. I think a person should be able to do both, to be honest with you. Uh, but I really, I was impressed when I went to drum corps, I was impressed. That, that kids could learn how to play music by rote because it was something that was not in my experience. Again, I'm 50 times removed from the fact, but the, the, the word I'd always heard was Buddy Rich had a guy that would read the charts for him, see here at once, and there you go. That's probably true. So I, I don't know, I know Buddy Rich was a classic character. He was a phenomenal drummer. Uh, I, I know that he learned, uh, when he was a kid, he, he was learning how to play and play with other musicians before. I don't know if he ever learned how to read, to be honest with you. I heard the same thing about Frank Arsenault. I heard Frank Arsenault couldn't really read, uh, but but you get him up on snare drum, and man, he'd play. So. I know Buddy Rich was really, particular about his audience. We saw him once and he had served dinner before and he came in, he sat down and he said, well you still got the goddamn dishes on the table. Get them off. I'm not playing while they're flattering away. And he sat there and waited until they cleared all the tables. <laughs> yeah, I mean the character. 
Just to okay. make sure uh, with Frank Arsenal, Frank could read music. He could? I, I had heard that in his early days, he, I, I heard that he did learn how to read, but in his early days, he, he pretty much played by rose. He probably did, uh, but I can tell you in the late 50s, I drummed with him in, in my house, and uh, Frank could read. Good. That's great. He couldn't sight read, but he could read. Uh, you know, okay. He could take a score and go home, and the next day come back and play it. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Rick, your time... Okay. Official time is up, but I have a comment and a question about uh, number 102. First of all, uh, thank Don't you. ask me to play it again. No, thank, <laughs> you, thank you for playing it again, because yeah. I was right with you until the 5-4. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the question is, what was your inspiration for giving it that title? Giving 102. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember, but I'll tell you this. If you think about today being 420, um, 420, I don't know, uh, is, is anyone familiar with that term out in California? 420? Since Colorado, Colorado has uh, legalized marijuana, uh, there's going to be a big 420 celebration in Colorado today. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting that uh, this convention was held on the weekend of 420. <laughs> so, we don't need that to be crazy. <laughs> Purely coincidence. Rick, thank you very much for a wonderful day.